So Donald Trump made a big prediction over the weekend that has excited a lot of people. The bloodbath prediction. Suddenly we discover the New York Times thinks that's two words. Other news organizations think it's one word. His fanatical audience at his rally clapped for it. But they represent, remember, less than 1% of Donald Trump's 74 million voters who voted for Donald Trump last time. More than 99% of Trump voters have never been to a Trump rally. And a large portion of the fanatics who do go to Trump rallies go to all of them. So the number of people in this country willing to leave their homes to hear Donald Trump's voice is not increasing. And hundreds of people who are willing to do almost anything at the sound of Donald Trump's voice are now in prison because of their devotion to Trump, which they expressed violently on January 6th. Other people who heard Donald Trump's prediction this weekend are excited by it in a very negative direction. Many of them, and perhaps some of you, are feeling fear tonight because of Donald Trump's words. That's what he wants you to feel. He wants you to fear. He wants your fear. Don't give it to him. When Donald Trump predicts there will be a bloodbath in this country if he doesn't win the Electoral College, you should take that for what it is, a Trump prediction. That prediction is coming from the same man who in a presidential campaign in the same setting said Mexico would pay for the wall. Not only was Donald Trump unable to get Mexico to pay for a wall along the entire Mexican border, which would have cost uncountable billions of dollars, Donald Trump can't even get Mexico to pay his $450 million bond so that his assets can be protected during his appeal of the judgment against him for business fraud in New York State. That's the same Donald Trump who predicted under oath that $400 million would be no problem for him because he has that much in cash. He was lying, and he was lying about the bloodbath. Here's a prediction for you, and it's from me. And my prediction track record isn't great, but it's better than Donald Trump's. There will be no bloodbath. The people willing to bleed for Donald Trump and draw blood of police officers for Donald Trump have been convicted of that crime by the hundreds, have been sent to prison with more of them on their way to prison. And every Trump supporter who was unwilling to participate in a bloodbath for Donald Trump was not more encouraged to do so by watching what happened on January 6th and watching what happened to the criminal lunatics who have been arrested and prosecuted for what they did on January 6th. Don't let him scare you with a power that he does not have. There will be no bloodbath. And there will be no 100% tariff, which is to say 100% sales tax on cars manufactured in Mexico, which is what Donald Trump was talking about when he decided to threaten the country with a bloodbath. Today, the Biden-Harris campaign said Donald Trump has shown us who he is time and time again and released this video. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath, and it's going to be a bloodbath for the country. Jews will not but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Are you willing to condemn white supremacists and militia groups? Stand back and stand by. Please rise for the horribly and unfairly treated January 6th hostages. There will be a lot of pardons and commutations of January 6th defendants. Yes, absolutely. Tell your supporters now, no matter what, no violence. And it's going to be a bloodbath.
You can be sure that the news organizations that provided nothing short of hysterical coverage for days over President Biden saying the word Mexico when he meant the word Egypt in an otherwise completely cogent assessment of the crisis situation in the Middle East will have much less to say about Donald Trump's bloodbath prediction. And they will probably have nothing to say about the other insanity that came as the gift wrapping on the bloodbath prediction. Donald Trump actually got applause from the most uninformed voters who have ever listened to a political speech when they clapped for the bloodbath and they clapped for Donald Trump's promise to double the price of new cars in America. Yes, he predicted both of those things at the same time, doubling the price of cars manufactured in Mexico and sold in the United States and the bloodbath were wrapped up together in that speech in which he blamed Joe Biden for cars being manufactured in Mexico. We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. Okay, so while promising a bloodbath, Donald Trump promised that a $40,000 Ford manufactured in Mexico will now cost $80,000 next year. That, of course, would help raise the price of every other car on the market in the United States. And Donald Trump's fanatics at the rally, many of whom drove there in cars manufactured in Mexico, clapped for that. They all believe the Trump lie that tariffs imposed by Donald Trump are paid by other countries. Maybe it's because of the history of the Boston Tea Party, but when I was a kid, every elementary school student in Boston knew more about international trade than Donald Trump and his followers do now. Donald Trump will not impose any tariffs, which are actually American sales taxes, on cars manufactured in Mexico because those cars are manufactured under the revised NAFTA agreement that was signed by Donald Trump. Donald Trump personally agreed to every one of those cars being manufactured in Mexico right now. And Joe Biden had nothing to do with that agreement. Donald Trump and his followers do not know that since NAFTA was approved in 1994, the United States has almost doubled the number of cars manufactured in the United States. In 1993, the year before NAFTA, 4.5 million cars were manufactured in the United States. And last year, 7.6 million cars were manufactured in the United States, something that couldn't possibly have happened if you listen to Donald Trump. And what Donald Trump and his followers don't seem to realize is that foreign automobile manufacturers are now manufacturing cars in the United States and adding to our total. Most BMWs sold in America are manufactured in the Republican state of South Carolina. Volkswagen manufactures cars in the United States. Toyota manufactures cars in the United States. And so foreign competition has, in fact, made the American automobile industry stronger, and it has made American cars better, which is exactly what classical capitalist theory tells you competition is supposed to do. And that is what Republicans used to believe. But now Republicans believe anything Donald Trump tells them. And sadly, many people who oppose Donald Trump believe every threat Donald Trump issues. That is exactly the way Donald Trump wants it. And that is exactly the way Vladimir Putin wants it in Russia. Vladimir Putin wants the admiration of people who support him, and he wants the abject fear of people who oppose him. Alexei Navalny would not give Vladimir Putin his fear. And Vladimir Putin simply could not bear the fact that Alexei Navalny did not fear him. This weekend, Vladimir Putin through another one of his fraudulent elections, has established himself as the longest reigning dictator of Russia since the mass murderer Joseph Stalin.
Vladimir Putin desperately wants Donald Trump to win the Electoral College because if Donald Trump does win the Electoral College, then Vladimir Putin believes he will finally be able to have the bloodbath in Ukraine that he has been dreaming about. Vladimir Putin will do everything he can once again through disinformation and possible espionage and all the other activities that were documented in the Mueller investigation of the 2016 election to try to win the Electoral College for Donald Trump once again. And if that happens, Donald Trump will be very grateful to Vladimir Putin once again. And Donald Trump will try in every way that he can to emulate Vladimir Putin and to support Vladimir Putin. And in this country, all that it takes to stop Donald Trump is voting. It doesn't take courage. It doesn't take the kind of courage it took for Alexei Navalny to try to stop Vladimir Putin. Donald Trump can be stopped with votes. You can shut him up about bloodbaths with votes. Donald Trump is the world's weakest aspiring dictator. You have power over him. If he can't get your vote, Donald Trump wants to get your fear. Alexei Navalny would not let Vladimir Putin have his fear. Don't ever let Donald Trump have yours. Andrew Weissman, I have never seen a draft jury instruction quite like it. Uh, what are Jack Smith's options here? Well, there's a reason you've never seen anything like it. I don't think Bradley and I have either. Um, you know, last week, Bradley was trying to come up with the best Yiddish phrase for this. And I have sort of two two M words for you. Meshugana, which is what this is, um, because the choice is that was given by Judge Cannon to the parties is to ask uh, Jack Smith, um, so please draft a jury instruction assuming that the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. And the second one is please draft a jury instruction assuming that the earth is square. Um, and so the second M word is mandamus. Mandamus is the ability to, um, it's, it's not an appeal, it's for extraordinary actions by a district court that it so clearly violate the law that you can appeal it right then and there. It's a very tough standard. But at this point, um, what she did today is so nutty um, and so against uh, a point that, that Bradley's been making, which is that the 11th Circuit has actually already decided this issue, and her what she has proposed is against what the 11th Circuit has already reversed her on. Um, so th there, I really think, you know, to the extent that you think that she is engaging in partisanship, which I do, um, there really has to be a time that you take her up on and you do this mandamus to get to the 11th Circuit before she gets to trial, because that's when she has the um, unilateral ability to thread this case out, and it cannot be appealed. So I was just checking the calendar on my phone to make sure, yeah, it's March 18th. It's the day after St. Patrick's Day. I should have known that, I guess. Uh, and Bradley, the deadline is April 2nd, uh, issued by the judge for... Uh, Jack Smith and defense counsel to respond to, to possible jury instructions. Uh, what happens next? What happens between now and April 2nd? So Jack Smith, if he doesn't take Andrew up on his idea of seeking mandamus, and I actually don't think they're going to do that yet, I think they're going to try to fashion a response to this to basically say, all right, Judge, I'm not sure where you were going with that. But um, no, that's not how this works. If you think that's the state of the law is what you put in that second line item, that's fine. Issue a ruling, grant Trump his motion to dismiss as he outlined it uh, under the Presidential Records Act, and we'll take it to the 11th Circuit. But that's an issue of law for the judge. That's not an issue for the jury. There's nothing for the jury to do with that instruction. If that was what they went to trial with, if I was Trump, Trump's lawyers, I'd sit there, take a nap through trial, play Candy Crush, and then the moment the government rested, say, I move for a directed verdict for acquittal, 
because you can't lose. Mm -hmm. The jury instruction automatically grants you a win. So, yeah, it, they've got to push back. I think they've got to do that before they try mandamus. So uh, everyone is interested in schedules here. Obviously, a uh, delay is at hand with what happens next, Bradley, one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, so the bigger issue here is obviously we're supposed to go to trial on this one in May. That's already, you know, everybody's agreeing. It's just not going to happen at this point, especially with how long she took with the classified issues. Now we're talking about, okay, July, August. So one, why are we even discussing jury instructions in March? We're, we're, now we're close to that yet. But two, if we have to deal with the idea of going up to the 11th Circuit, how long does that take? Even on an expedited basis, that could easily be weeks, if not a month or so, to resolve that. That could push everything into the fall. That's where this becomes a problem with these really weird orders of, what are you talking about? That's not how this works. If nothing else, it simply is going to muck up the process and delay. Things. Yeah, and if you have to go to the 11th Circuit now over uh, jury instructions, uh, then sure, there's, <laughs> there'll be many other trips to the 11th Circuit that this judge could create. How would you uh, gauge uh, what we just heard uh, in Netanyahu's response to Senator Schumer? Well, I guess the question is, how many times can he lie in such a short clip? Uh, you know, complaining that it was inappropriate for an American official to intervene when he does it all the time. And indeed, this past weekend said that he was rooting for Donald Trump uh, is, of course, hypocritical. Uh, him saying that the majority of the Israeli people support him uh, is ludicrous at this point. Uh, if the majority do not support his war plans, uh, and he has a tiny, tiny rating uh, in terms of his political future. Um, and, you know, he was trying to make a point uh, that the American, you know, people are behind him. And they're not. And I think the Schumer speech indicates just how far um, the base that was traditionally supporting Israel has moved away from this Israeli government because it has been so odious and brutal. Uh, Peter, uh, for people who have been watching this a long time and watching these, these uh, people in the center of this drama a long time, uh, Senator Schumer was... I don't know, somewhere at the bottom of my list, uh, of not on my list, of people from whom I could expect a speech like he gave on the Senate floor last week. Right. When it comes to foreign policy in general, and Israel in particular, Schumer is on the right end of the Democrats in Congress. Remember, this is a guy who opposed Barack Obama's Iran nuclear deal in 2015. And I think the most significant thing that Schumer said in his speech was not his call for Netanyahu to go. It was that he they said that he was open to the U.S. conditioning military aid to Israel. That is a huge shift. Before this war started, only one Democratic senator, Bernie Sanders, was open to that. Schumer was now saying that this is now a widespread position among Democrats in Congress. The United States has not essentially conditioned military aid to Israel since the early 1990s. That's how big a transformation this is. And, David, uh, you would think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu would be concerned about r repairing, preserving uh, relations with the United States in both parties. Uh, I, I don't see any effort that he's making to hold on to support in the Democratic Party when you see Majority Leader Schumer uh, go as far as he went last week. He, he made a bet nine years ago that he was going to play politics in the United States. That's when, of course, he went to the U.S. Congress around President Obama and has ever since essentially joined the MAGA movement within the Republican Party, counted on the support of the extreme right wing and evangelicals, and essentially turned his back on the people who have primarily been the support of Israel for a long time. So he's made a political calculus. Uh, I think it's the wrong political calculus. He's made the wrong military calculus here. And what he's seeing is not just the Senate, but this administration trying to move away from him, trying to constrain his behavior using all the tools at their disposal are at least now considering them, as Peter said, which is overdue but welcome.